Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 5th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can also follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain how a recent Anchorage Daily News editorial board op-ed outlines a fiscal future that would completely undermine former Governor Jay Hammond's vision for the state. Second, we explain how the Permanent Fund Corporation and others are manufacturing a fake earnings reserve crisis and why Alaska's press seems to be buying it hook, line, and sinker. And third, we explain why Alaska's so-called progressives are just a rehash of the old limousine liberals. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get into this, Brad. We've got a lot of stuff to cover, and uh, I had to chuckle as I read through some of the uh, some of the backstory stuff that you sent me uh, for the different topics this morning. I just I had to laugh because you know I would just say history doth repeat itself over and over and over again. It's uh, it's a little painful out there, but we can see it. So let's talk about uh, number one. <clears throat> You've got an outline. Uh, provided by our friends over there at the Binkley family blog of the top 20% plan for Alaska's fiscal future. And let me just say it ain't, it ain't groovy all the way around. Uh, give me the, give me the rundown here. So the Binkley family blog, for those who haven't heard that phrase on the show before is the uh, Anchorage daily news uh, uh, op-ed page uh, written by the editorial uh, board uh, written by the uh, written by or for the, uh, the Binkley family, one of the two. Um, and th- this, the most recent weekend op-ed, uh, was like the perfect encapula- in, in, encapsulation of, of the, uh, uh, of what the top 20% agenda is for Alaska fiscal. And basically the, the, the subhead is undo Hammond's vision. Um, here's the summary that's in the op-ed, uh, of, uh, of what they're proposing. The two parts of the permanent fund is, it's a, it's a two- prong agenda. First, the two parts of the permanent fund, the constitutionally protected principle and the unprotected earnings reserve should be combined into one. Second, in addition, Alaska needs a hard constitutional limit on how much the legislature can spend, including on permanent fund dividends each year, uh, including the permanent fund dividends under the cap. And basically this would undo what Hammond's uh, original vision uh, was for uh, uh, for how we were going to uh, do Alaska's fiscal future. The first one combined the the two fund the the two permanent fund funds the the corpus and the earnings uh, together or, and the earnings reserve together basically allows and, and 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 let me say quickly the 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 Binkley family blog doesn't disclose what's really going on here. So you got to sort of understand the backstory and understand what Hammond's vision was and understand how the, how the pieces worked to, to pull this together. But the first one, it, combining the two funds together essentially opens up the corpus. Now they right. will say it doesn't because they'll say, well, we're just going to take, we're going to cap how much we take from, uh, from each, uh, from, from the overall uh, combined uh, amount. And we're going to cap it at some, at some percentage. 
But let's go back over the last 10 years. How'd that work for the SBR? Oh, we're just going to take a little bit of the SBR, <laughs> the statutory budget reserve to dodge to dodge taxes. And then when that was gone, oh, we're just going to take a little bit of the constitutional budget reserve. And of course, the constitutional budget reserve, we have to pay back someday. So, you know, we're not going to take that much of it. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that, that's now essentially drained. And, and then it was, oh, we're just going to take a little bit of the permanent fund dividend, uh, to, uh, to, to support government. And just for a while, we're not really going to, you know, we're not going to mess with the underlying permanent fund dividend. We're just going to take a little bit and we're going to take it a little bit for a while. And now we're on track for the permanent fund dividend, frankly, to be, to be wiped out by the, by the middle of the next, uh, next decade. So when you look back at history about, about we're just going to take a little bit and don't worry, there will be, it, it'll be around, uh, the SBR will be around, the CBR will be around, the permanent fund dividend will be around. When you look back at history, you can see what's happened. It's, it's, it's been, you know, we're going to creep it open a little bit and, uh, and, and just take a little bit for this emergency situation. Uh, and then, you know, basically it's gone. Now it's going to take a while to drain 60, 70 billion dollars, but we drain twenty billion dollars out of the SBR and the CBR mm -hmm. in the in and 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 counting what we've taken out of the permanent fund dividend, we've drained twenty billion dollars in just the last decade. So you think sixty billion dollars is gonna is gonna take a while, uh, but it's not really. It's well, gonna, there's, there's it's a compounding really there's a compounding problem there too, right? So for every twenty billion dollars that you take out of the fund, you essentially remove twenty five percent of its earning potential, twenty to 30% of its earning potential. So it just accelerates the problem because then the returns are less in those coming years. So you have to draw more. The more you take, the more you have to draw because the re returns are lower. And so it's an, it wouldn't be, oh, 20 billion a year. So we've got 30 years or 20 billion a decade. So we got 30 years. No, no, no. It accelerates every year because you're reducing the seed corn. So it could be in as little as 20 years, 15, 20 years, because all of a sudden you're sucking away all the generation power out of it. And, and people will say, oh no, we won't do that. Just like they said, oh no, we won't do that to the SBR or the CBR or the permanent fund dividend. Oh no, we won't do that. Don't worry about that. We recognize that we have an obligation to future generations. Well, the CBR is all about future generations. Frankly, the PFD is all about future generations and, and we're draining both of those. And why are we doing that? because we're so desperate to avoid taxes uh, as a revenue source that we'll just drain everything else um, uh, that, that we can argue aren't taxes uh, uh, while, we're, while we're doing it. So um, I don't have a lot of faith that, that when we get to the outer range of, of starting to really you know, rip into the permanent fund corpus, that that people are going to say, oh, future generations, no, no, we're going to keep hands off. We're going to we're going to now have taxes on ourselves. I th I think this is a long term plan to keep the party going as long as you can for the top twenty percent non residents and non resident industries, and the oil companies to keep the party going as long as you can by by draining down the state's reserves. And you know, oil's going to run out someday, and so you sort of look at the trajectory of how long. You can drain the permanent fund corpus. You sort of look at the trajectory of how long oil lasts, and maybe the oil companies are gone by the time uh, by by the time the the permanent fund is is drained, and so they never have to pay an additional amount for the additional spending. Well, anyway, let's back it up for just a second. And I'm sorry, I hate to interrupt your your flow here, but I mean Hammond's vision for the permanent fund itself was for that day when oil revenues diminished and went away. He wanted to create a, a pump, a well of money, like we have wells of oil, that once the oil ran dry, we would be able to continue to run the state. And they are, again, wanting to shatter that vision. They, want to sh they don't want it to be a lump of money that just continues to spin out the right amount. They do not want to append or control their spending at all. Yeah, the ultimate spending cap, the ultimate spending cap is the earnings reserve. If you do drain the earnings reserve under the current constitution, you can't get, you can't get to the, the corpus. And so the, the, if you do drain the earnings reserve, then, then you're going to have to go to taxes or you're going to have to cut spending. And, and, and the desire to avoid taxes will trump 
the desire to spend and and will and and at that point will curb at least curb spending. That's the ultimate spending cap. And what they and what the Binkley family blog and others are proposing to do is just blow through that, combine the two so that the earnings reserve doesn't act as a spending cap. You can just keep on going. And and you say and they'll say, oh, we're just going to limit it to five percent a year. Well, <laughs> again, let's look at the CBR, the SBR, the CBR, and the permanent fund dividend. We're going to limit it to. No, you're not. I mean, at, when you when you get to that outer limit, you're going to say, well, just a little bit more, just a little bit more, just a little bit more, um, and keep on going in an effort to avoid taxes. Anyway, that's part one, and that's and and that's the that's the backstory for why part one is really an attack. Uh, on the permanent fund corpus. Part two is the spending cap. And everybody goes, yes, absolutely. We must have a spending cap, an effective spending cap. And what the Binkley family blog is trying to leverage up on that is leverage up on that statement and say, oh, let's kill the PFD while we're at it. Because what a spending what a spending cap will do is, let's take Natasha von, Him von Imhoff's uh, uh, proposal for a spending cap. It was to tie it to inflation. So you, you start at some base, pick a base, and 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 you tie uh, the spending cap to inflation, and it gradually creeps up. Well, let's look at other revenues. Oil is at best, according to the latest Department of Revenue uh, uh, forecast, is at best stabilizing. And probably if some of these fields don't turn out to be as 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 prolific as as people think they're going to be probably we'll start back on the decline or oil prices may go down we'll start back on the decline so what's the grease between the two you have rising spending you have declining oil revenues stabilized or declining oil revenues what's the grease that's going on between the two it's a permanent fund it's a permanent fund dividend so when they talk about Let's have a spending cap and include the permanent fund dividend inside the cap. What they're really saying is let's make the permanent fund dividend the grease that will that will that will fill that gap between spending um, and in stabilized or declining revenues as long as as long as the permanent fund dividend lasts. Then we'll kick into phase two and go after the corpus. Uh, but it's but it's not, you know, the spending cap sounds good. It sounds like something we should all support. But if you're if you really focus on what Hammond's vision was, which was to have the the permanent fund dividend be a portion of the state's wealth, a portion of the state's earnings going to directly to the state citizens. Um, if you really focus on that vision, what that what the spending cap is, the way they and Natasha define it is a way of gradually using up the permanent fund dividend without saying you're doing it. Right. If you want a spending cap. Just as the fiscal policy working group said, if you want a spending ca cap, it needs to be part of a comprehensive solution that includes uh, protections for the permanent fund dividend. Well, and there's different types of spending caps, right? I mean, that's the thing. There's a, you know, the, how the spending cap is constructed is just as important, if not more important, than actually having a spending cap. Uh, because if you include the PFD underneath there and everything else, it bulks that up. Um, and it's like that last minute rush at the end of the year with all that state money. If we don't spend all this money, we won't get the same amount next year kind of thing. It's that same kind of mindset of uh, we've got to bulk it up as much as we can before that spending cap kicks in. because the, And so they include things like the PFD underneath of it. And that blows the whole purpose of the spending cap out of the water. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly right. Including uh, uh, you, you, you hit on another point about this, including the permanent fund dividend under the spending cap increases the base amount. So it's inflation on top of an increased base amount. And and the permanent fund dividends in there. So it's just more and more grease that, uh, that they can right. use. To, to and this, spending going this on. is what we saw in Will Stapp's proposal for the income tax, which was fine right up until the end when they stuffed for the, the PFD. For the, in for the spending cap, you said income tax. Will Stapp's proposal for the spending cap. I apologize for the spending cap. Yeah, but it was the same thing, right? It was great right up till the last minute where they're like, oh, we'll shoehorn the PFD underneath there. And all of a sudden, now it's become not only irrelevant, but dangerous at that point. Ron actually... Because I was thinking about this as Brad was talking about it, and I'm like, these people, you know, who these people, why would they do that? Why would they? And Ron actually brings up the perfect point. How many legislators who are taking the dividend will be in office in 20 years, or for that matter, will still live in the state? And that's a viable question. 
uh, because I mean, that's, a, I was thinking, why would you do this? Why would you do this? If you know, the state is going to be upside down and underwater deeply in 20 years. I mean, no, no more than 30 years, but 20 years, how, what, why would you do that? And they're like, well, cause they'll probably be dead, right. <laughs> or gone or moved out of state, or it won't be their problem. And I'm just like, how could people be so short-sighted? How can they not care about the future of the state enough? And I guess we're going to get ours and everybody else will have to live on what's left or. Yeah, it's, oh. it's essentially, I mean, it's Alaska's history, right? People are mining the state. They're, they're yeah. mining, they're, 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 they're scraping the state, taking all they can. Strip and mining. Then, yeah, strip mining. And then go, and then going someplace else. And we usually think that, and think of that in the context of minerals or, or, to some degree, we think about that in the context of oil, but it's also true in, in the context of another asset, the, the the permanent fund asset, and they're and they're gradually strip mining the benefits of the permanent fund, the dividend and the and the life and the permanent nature of the fund. They're gradually strip mining it because they want to avoid taxes on themselves while while they're here, accumulate more wealth for themselves, and then take it, you know, someplace else. Um, or enjoy it while they're here and, you know, let the future fend for itself. But it, it is, it's a, it's a form of strip mining. It's a form of strip mining. I mean, we're familiar with strip mining uh, minerals. We're familiar with strip mining oil. It's a form of strip mining the, the, the state's fiscal asset. And, uh, you know, and just add to that, how about, uh, how about the clear cut logging? It's the same, right? Right. It's the same concept. We don't care what happens to any of this. We want the, we want the, the, the resource, the materials, the logs or whatever. If a flood comes in and wipes out the hillside because there's no more tree, we don't care. We're, we're not going to be there anymore anyway. So let's just go ahead and do it. Uh, it is the most short sighted, uh, thing that I could think of. I mean, it's, it really is the greed, right? I mean, that's, that's really what it comes down to is it, it is a, a, a snapshot of the greed and the entitlement is astounding to me. I just don't fathom it. I mean, that's exactly what it is. I mean, I want my program. I want things to be set up the way that I want. I don't want to pay for it. Uh, I want to keep as much of my money as I can and then I'll go wander off in the pucker brush when it comes time to retire or whatever. But at least I got mine. Yeah, it's um, uh, it, it. I mean, Hammond really thought through this stuff. If you if you think about this deeply enough and think about through what he was trying to do, you really understand that he that that these two pieces, the 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 protecting the corpus, the permanent nature of the corpus, don't allow attacks on the corpus. And the permanent fund dividend uh, as a way of providing, you know, the state citizens a direct benefit of the state's mineral wealth. Those two pieces were were genius, were fiscal genius. And, and what we have is a select group of the state who figured out a way, who figured out that they can prolong their, you know, their, their good times, their party, their no taxes party. Uh, they're spending and no taxes party. I mean, it, both pieces go together. They can prolong it if they can just get access to the corpus and just cut and just eliminate the permanent fund dividend and convert the permanent fund dividend over to their benefit by covering taxes they otherwise should be paying for the increased spending. Um, and, and so they're undoing both pieces of Hammond's vision. They won't say it. They don't say it. In fact, they claim to still be still be pursuing it. But but that's exactly what they're doing. They're undercutting both pieces of Hammond's vision. Brad Keithley, our guest, uh, the weekly top three continues. Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. You can find them at ak4sb.com, on Twitter, on YouTube, or on uh, yeah, on YouTube, on Facebook. Uh, he's everywhere. And of course, don't forget to catch his column in the Alaska Landmine uh, every week. He's got the chart of the week. Uh, com, uh, uh, thing going on. All right, Brad. So number two, we just talked about the top 20% overall plan. And now we're going to talk about the, you say the fake fiscal crisis. We do have a fiscal crisis, but they are spinning it in a completely different way than what, uh, how I see it and how you see it. Go ahead. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the, the whole predicate for the ADN editorial for the Binkley family blog editorial was that we have a crisis with the permanent fund earnings 
And so we need to do something, the earnings reserve. So we need to do something to, to attend to that crisis. And that is collapse the, uh, collapse the two accounts into a single account. And then let's add on this, this, this spending cap that includes the PFD uh, as, a, as, a, as an additional step. But the whole predicate is we have a crisis. We need to do something about it. Well, the crisis is this claimed uh, crisis of running out of money in the permanent fund earnings reserve. And that was captured this past week by an article that uh, James Brooks did for the Alaska Be Beacon that then got repeated throughout other papers in the state. The headline was, New Alaska Permanent Fund Reports Show Fiscal Crisis Growing Closer. And that is the crisis that the claim crisis that the Permanent Fund Earnings Reserve is going to be drained. You know, as I read that story and as I read a couple of other stories, Jack Barnhill did one up, at, uh, up in the Fairbanks News Miner. As I read those stories, it dawned on me, we don't have a financial reporter in this state. We have political reporters in this state or general reporters, but we don't have a solid financial reporter. We don't have somebody who would fit in at the Wall Street Journal or fit in at the Financial Times, uh, the London-based Financial Times. We don't have somebody who understands finances and, and how the permanent fund uh, corporation is spinning this earnings story is they're spinning it as a political story. Oh, we have a crisis. Just accept what we say that we have a crisis. And now we have a political problem that we need the, to get the politicians to, to do X, Y, Z in order to respond to the crisis. We don't have anybody who has the financial background that says, okay, wait a second, let's talk about this crisis. Explain to me why we have a crisis. We just have political reporters who are accepting that as a given, and then going on and writing writing the uh, political story. I'm not sure we've got a reporter in this state. I don't mean to be disparaging, but I'm not sure we've got a reporter in this state who off the top of their head could explain the difference between a balance sheet and an income statement. Um, th because that's just not what they report on, and that's not what they dig into. But when you dig into what this, this story that the Permanent Fund Corporation is spinning about, about the earnings reserve, you understand that it's a fake story. There's two things. We've talked about them on the, on, the, on the show before. We'll probably talk about them a lot of times again. But there's two things you've got you've to dig into to understand what's going on with this fiscal crisis. First is, what happened to the $8 billion? The $8 billion that got, <laughs> that, that got transferred out of the earnings reserve that wasn't required uh, for inflation proofing, wasn't required for any other reason but got drained out of the earnings reserve uh, and put into the corpus over the last uh, uh, several years. The $8 billion, the first tranche, the four, first $4 billion went explicitly for prepaying for inflation proofing to allow the corporation to have the money so that when we got to a point where we couldn't inflation proof some inflation proof in some year, you had, they had a reserve in there that they could draw down and say, okay, we, we've, we've inflation proof because we got prepaid for it. The second $4 billion went among, among many as a, as for the same rationalization. Okay. We got a few spare dollars in the earnings reserve. Let's stuff it into the, into the, into the corpus. And it'll be there to cover inflation proofing. If we get into situations where, where it's not convenient or not good uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to inflation proof in any given year, what happened to that $8 billion? Now we, I've been tracking it. And I do uh, monthly uh, charts that show what's going on with the eight billion dollars. And if you, even if you accounted for the eight billion dollars as as if you accounted for the eight billion dollars as prepayments, there's still about five billion or so in there that hasn't been used as prepayment. Because what's going on is when you get to the years in which there should be prepayment, which, when you should use the prepayment, they're stuffing more money into the into the into the permanent fund corpus um, to, uh, to, as they say, for inflation proofing when they have already prepaid for the inflation proofing. So you're double paying for infl inflation proofing. If that $8 billion hadn't been prepaid over and had been left in the earnings reserve as it, as it was entitled to be left, because it, there was no reason for it to be transferred to the corpus. If the $8 billion had been left in there, we wouldn't be having a crisis. We wouldn't be talking about a crisis. We'd have plenty of money in the earnings reserve. Uh, and the earnings reserve would be doing just fine, thank you very much. And we wouldn't be having having this crisis. 
The second thing that's going on, when you when you look at the accounting, is they they are uh, 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 setting aside it when, when they get to a fiscal year, they not only set aside, they not only accrue the expenses that are due that fiscal year, which are inflation proofing if they're going to pay inflation proofing that year, plus the POMB draw POMB draw for that year. They're also in accruing an amount for next year's POMB. So when you say, when you say, you know, the earnings reserve is drained down, what's going on is there is there over accruing, over uh, subtracting an amount for that should be in another uh, fiscal year. They're over subtracting it in this fiscal year. Those two things are making the earnings reserve look a lot smaller and a lot less. Uh, than it actually right. should be if you reflect the the prepayments as a prepayment asset and if you and if you don't advance accrue uh, for a future year POMB, the earnings reserve would be looking just fine. In fact, it'd be looking uh, uh, better than just fine. But so what you're saying is these are accounting gimmicks essentially to show that the fund is super low. We used all these accounting gimmicks to show that the fund is super low and that's why our crisis is here. If we used regular accounting and didn't didn't shell game it, it would be okay. Yep, exactly right. And so what you've got this is a predicate then. So now we've got a crisis, right? Because we're because the 8 billion dollars has suddenly disappeared off of the prepayment books. And because we're over recurring for POMB by including the future year's POMB in the current year, all of a sudden we've got a crisis. I mean, if you drain an account enough, if you take enough out of it, if you if you don't show the assets in it, you can make it look pretty bad. Um, and, and that's what's going on here. It's a setup then for the ADN and others claim is, oh my God, we got a crisis. So now we need to merge these two accounts together to deal with this crisis. And guess what? That's backdoor access to the corpus. Um, so it's it's a it's a well thought out. I'll give them. I'll give those who are engaged in this that it's a well thought out plan uh, to create a crisis. And 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 we've got the state's political reporters because we don't have any financial reporters who can dig into this and understand what's going on. I haven't seen one question about what happened to the eight billion dollars. I haven't seen one question about why are you double accruing? Why are you accruing future years POMV draws uh, in, uh, in in the current year? I haven't seen one question about that. They're just the political reporters are just accepting as given whatever pablum the the the, the permanent fund corporation spits out and says, oh well, okay, well that, now we have a political crisis because we need to we need to do something. And I, and I, James Brooks, and 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 I, other reporters in the state, I understand political crises. I understand how to report on political crises. So once you tell me that you have a financial crisis and I don't have to think about that because you've told me there's a financial crisis, I can go write, you know, stories after story after story after story about the about the uh, about the about the political crisis that that flows from that. It's a setup. And it's a setup for things that that then show up in the ADN. We have to merge the two accounts together. We have to drain the PFD What's by, a inclu by including it under the cap. It's parroting, right? I mean, we've seen this now. The Bert Stedman's talked about it. The permanent fund boards talked about it. <coughs> All these different, you know, oh, oh, it's a, and now the newspapers are starting. It's the same thing we saw in the education thing, right? Oh, we flat funded education. Never a deeper analysis of what that is, of what the true dollars were, of the fact that we spent over the BSA. None of those things. It just became a talking point. And the journalists in Alaska have not been digging deep enough in a non-biased way to get both sides of the argument to, to figure it out. So they're just basically parroting what they're being told. At this point, there's a fiscal crisis and we need to combine the accounts. That's the talking point. Yeah. And, and, and Michael, I don't want to, <coughs> I don't want to blame the journalists in the sense that, in the sense that, you know, they're, they're not dig. Well, I, I do blame that they're not digging into it, but they're not. We don't have journalists who have the background to dig into it. We don't have financial journalists with financial background to dig into it. I'll say the two best stories on the permanent fund board shenanigans, the two best stories on Ellie Rubenstein and the, and the joke that that, that that created with the permanent fund board, they showed up in the financial times. The two best, the stories that had the best quotes, that did the, the best analysis 
of what was going on were in the the Financial Times because because David Rubenstein was involved. Ellie's dad was 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 implicated in in all this. So the Financial Times picked up on it. But but those are the those were the stories that really I think ground into the ground into the situation and did the best reporting on it. We're just we don't have that. I mean, because Alaska is such a political state, um, and frankly, because you know there's there's probably not a whole lot of people who want to read about about uh, balance sheets and income statements. We just don't have the financial reporters and. And the permanent fund corporation is taking advantage of that. The ADN, the Binkley family, the, the the rest of the people who are pushing for these proposals are taking advantage of that because we don't have the financial reporters there uh, to dig into it. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Final thought, Brad, on number two before we move on? Well, we need somebody. I mean, it, this may be a plea to the editors, not to the ADN, because they've already set their course, but maybe the Alaska Beacon you need financial reporters. You need people who come at these stories. These are financial stories. Alaska is now a financial state. We're now living on the permanent fund court. We're now living on the on the on the permanent fund. You need financial reporters. You need people with financial backgrounds to dig into the claims that the permanent fund board, the permanent fund corporation, is making to understand them and to and to probe them and and ask questions about the eight billion dollars and to ask questions about the double the double look accrual that's going on for POMB. I'm going back here because Donna uh, made a made a comment that I was like, there we go. Dunleavy should have vetoed the $1 billion inflation proofing. He and his permanent fund board and Bert Stedman are creating the crisis. And uh, I mean, that's it. it. This is a manufactured crisis. We've been talking about this for the last few months especially since the permanent fund board put out that white paper about combining the two funds. Uh, and you're right. We had $8 billion in inflation proofing. Why didn't Dunleavy just didn't, why didn't he veto that extra billion dollars that would have short circuited this whole discussion at that point, because then it wouldn't be overdrawing the fund. Right. I mean, there'd have to be some other kind of argument in there, but he's played either played right into the hands or is part of the whole thing at this point. Yeah, it's uh, Dunleavy sort of odd has been an odd character throughout all, all this. You remember the the four billion dollars that he that he said he vetoed that didn't actually get vetoed, right? Uh, right. The four billion transfer, the four billion dollar transfer from the earnings reserve into the permanent fund corpus. He said he vetoed it. It was in his veto message. But then when people went through and and looked at where the lines were actually drawn uh, in the in the appropriations bill, it didn't it didn't veto. There wasn't a line through the four billion dollar appropriation, and that second four billion dollars, the second half of the eight billion dollars, uh, slipped out of the slipped out of the earnings reserve into the corpus as a result as a result of that. At the time that happened, I, I said to myself, "Okay, well that's not a big deal because what he'll do is he'll just veto the 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 subsequent inflation proofing uh, to get back to to get the four billion dollars back into the earnings reserve as opposed to the earnings reserve." being drawn, being drawn down, you know, he can correct the error that way. He hasn't done it. I mean, he's just kept going with, uh, with, uh, signing the bills that include the additional inflation proofing. So basically he's saying, yeah, I meant to, I meant to, to veto the $4 billion. Yeah. I know there was a way I still could have done that, even though some staffer didn't cross out the right line. Uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to leave the $4 billion in there. And then I'm going to let them play the game, play these games about the earnings reserve being drained. And I and I don't know I don't know Michael I don't know if that's I, I don't know if that's um, in a in a in a if he's being inattentive inattentiveness maybe that's the word I was going with, inattentive to uh, to the situation or he's you know in, intentionally letting that letting that four billion dollars that he that he said he was going to veto just stay in there without uh, without being a purpose but either way it's a key part of how we've gotten to this crisis of the earnings earnings reserve being in crisis, not having enough money. And even the $8 billion, even, even secreting the $8 billion out of the earnings reserve wasn't enough to tip it into this claim crisis. They had to go and do the, the, the future accrual for the, for, for a future year's POMV in there to get it down into, into crisis mode. So it's, it's one 
trick after another. But the, but now they now they've got you know James Brooks writing articles about the crisis, and uh, and now the ADN has what it needs as a predicate to write the op eds about. Oh my God, we have a crisis. We need to we need to consolidate the two funds. Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of. Uh it's disheartening to watch for sure. Uh, the governor, I mean, I think, uh, Kyle makes a valid point. Nobody makes a $4 billion boo-boo. I mean, really, uh, come on real. I mean, we're, we're, we're told that it was, Oh, it was a mistake. Uh, pay no attention to what this hand is doing. Pay attention to what's going on over here. And then, like you said, he could have fixed it and he didn't. And either he's getting really bad advice and paying attention to people he shouldn't, or he's part and parcel of this whole deal. And, uh, that is, uh, uh, you know, that is the frustrating part of this whole thing, especially since we can see again, where this is going when we start looking at the 10 year plan. I mean, this article that you wrote, um, this is the chart of the week. Uh, and that's, this is back from almost a year and a half ago, uh, 18 months ago, you wrote this article and it talks specifically about the spending caps and, and where the money goes and everything else. I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time. This is not anything necessarily new, and yet they continue to act like, oh, don't worry, it'll all be fine. It'll all work out in the end. Too big to fail, and we won't be here when the when the when the mushroom cloud goes up. We won't be here anyway, so it'll be fine. When the meltdown happens, and the reactor goes critical, we'll be in some other state doing our thing with our money that we got out of here on the way out. I mean, it's it's just astonishing. It is, and it's and it's and it's disappointing. I mean, it's disappointing from a number of standpoints. It's disappointing the governor doesn't step in and, and follow up on what he said he was doing going to do about the four billion dollars even though he has the opportunity to do it uh it's disappointing that we don't have a press that that that, that is knowledgeable enough about financial affairs to really dig into this stuff and and truly understand what's going on yeah absolutely the weekly top three continues we're on to number three from brad keithley alaskans for sustainable budgets what we'd like to call our truth tuesdays so, Brad, all this different talk and everything else, really progressives or are they just limousine liberals? Um, and I think we're seeing this play out. Uh, I don't know how progressive some of these policies are more than protectionist uh, than anything else. Give me what you got here. So Matt Buxton, who used to be a reporter for the for the uh, news miner uh, and was a good reporter for the news miner, um, uh, has turned into a blogger and a columnist, among other things, for the Alaska Current, which is sort of the the left equivalent, if you will, of the Midnight Sun. Uh, not the Midnight Sun, the... the must read. Must read, thank you. There used to... Matt used to write for the Midnight Sun. There used to be a blog called the Midnight Sun, and and Matt wrote for that for a while. Uh, sort of, but the Current is sort of the the left equivalent of the of, uh, of must read. And he wrote a column... Um, July in the July 31st version of the, of the, of the current that says progressive challengers lead in key Anchorage area legislative races. And the thing that really triggered me <laughs> about this, I was just sort of blowing through it. And yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, I, under, I understand where you're coming from. The thing that really triggered me uh, was this paragraph on the Kenai moderate pu pro public school Republican Nikiski Senator, Jesse Bjorkman holds a big fundraising lead over extreme right Republican Ben Carpenter. Carpenter has been one of the House's most conservative members proposing a statewide sales tax to pay for a large corporate income tax cut and has raised X amount today because Matt's reporting on the, on the amounts raised by the candidates today. Carpenter has been one of the House's most conservative members proposing a statewide sales tax to pay for a large corporate income tax cut. Well, a portion, a portion of the sales tax revenues that was that was in Ben's bill, Ben's sales tax sales tax bill, a portion did go to reduce the corporate income tax down to competitive levels, so that Alaska no longer has among the highest corporate income tax rates. It has one that's competitive, not low, but one that one that's can one that's competitive. But that was only about 30%, 35% of the revenues. The other, the remaining 65 to 70% of the revenues went to replace PFD cuts, went to be substitute revenues for PFD cuts. There is 
excuse me, Ben, you probably don't want me to say this, but there is nothing more progressive <laughs> in the world than using taxes to replace PFD cuts. It is, it is, you're replacing an extremely regressive tax in the form of PFD cuts with a still regressive, but much less regressive um, sales tax. And, and in the relative scheme of things, if you re replace something that's extremely regressive with a, with a less regressive tax, you're being progressive. You're, you're, you're moving in a, you're moving in a, in a progressive fashion. And it just, it just really irritated me that Buxton didn't at least give Ben the credit he's doing. I mean, he's due. Ben's taken a lot of slings and arrows, a lot of, a lot of shots about stepping out there and saying, we need to find a way, we need to find substitute revenues, Full, falling, uh, uh, following through on the fiscal policy working group's proposal to, of a little bit of everything and proposing the sales taxes as, as some of the little bit of everything that, uh, that we need to be able to stabilize the state's, uh, state's fiscal situation. It just really irritated me that when, you know, when somebody does something positive, somebody tries to make a, tries to create a solution that the left just, you know, attacks him anyway and uses, uses as the tool, this portion of, of, um, of, of what the sales tax was going to go for to soften the corporate income tax, the, to uses that tool to, 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 you know, attack him. Ben is more progressive Again, I'm, I'm sorry, Ben, that 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 I'm using that word, but but it's true. Ben is more progressive, less regressive. How about that? Ben is less regressive than virtually every other Democrat, <laughs> virtually every Democrat in the state. He is he is truly trying to get a a a an approach that is responsive to the economics of 80% of Alaska families, as well as the, the top 20% non-residents and, and oil. And he is, and he is being more responsive to the, to middle and lower income Alaska families than any, virtually any of the Democrats or any of the independents out there. And yet he gets labeled as a, as a, you know, extreme right conservative member. So I, right. so I sort of backed up from that and went through the article and, and, you know, you've got Matt Clayman, Matt Clayman, Oh, progressive Matt Clayman. Matt Clayman wants to drain the PFD. Matt Clayman is as is as top twenty percent oil oriented as Natasha von Imhoff. He wants to drain the PFD. He wants to spend it on things he wants to spend it on, as opposed to Natasha spending it on the things she wants to spend it on. But but he wants to spend it. He doesn't. He he wants to kill the PFD and drain the PFD and use it use it for spending. That is as 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 Matt Berman put it. ICER economist Matt Berman put it, that is the most regressive tax ever proposed. Not, not just the most regressive in the States, it's the most regressive tax ever proposed. And, and yet Clayman's right out in front of that. Zach Fields, another one, you know, another, another person that gets mentioned in, in Buxton's article, Zach Fields, oh, progressive. They're, they are the most regressive legislators that that you can find out there because they're pursuing they're pursuing PFD cuts and you get somebody like Ben, who who is being reasonable about it, trying to walk down the road of the fiscal policy working group, and he gets excoriated for it. So it's just, I mean, what we've got. Matt Clayman is the perfect limousine liberal. You know, spend money, spend it on my program, spend a lot of money, spend it on education, spend on this, spend it everywhere, but just don't tax me for it. You know take the money out of the hides of, of, of middle and lower income Alaska families. Just don't tax me. Just don't make me pay for it. Pay, make everybody else pay for it. The ultimate limousine liberal. And yet he gets, you know, the, the, the blogs, you know, praise him because he wants to spend and, and ignore where the revenues are coming from that, uh, that in turn, the, the progressives are wanting to spend. It's <clears throat> yeah. I mean, this framing of the whole thing of, Oh, we've got, I find it interesting that in this whole article, which I read through, um, it's, it, it, you know, it's pumping up the whole progressive movement and all the Democrats and everything else. And then it mentions Bjorkman as kind of their, their flag bearer in this race versus Carpenter. 
Um, and, uh, you know, th- this has been part of the problem is that they are, you know, f- championing all this whole idea of spending, spending, spending without ever asking the question of who pays. Now, in fairness to Ben, when he's, you know, you said, well, you know, he's he's proposing a tax to offset the PFD cuts. You propose the same thing, right? With a with a sales with a with a with a uh, 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 spending flat cap, tax. with a flat tax. You know, having the spending cap and then the flat tax that does the same thing. So, uh, you know, in fairness, you're proposing something similar, but in a different with a different type of tax. But overall, this whole thing has just been: how much can we spend? How much can we get away with? And it doesn't matter as long as the lower, you know, 60, 80, 60 to eighty percentile of income earners pay the bill, and and the top twenty percent doesn't have to. I, I think I think they fear Ben. I think I think they're 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 doing this job on Ben and trying to pump up Bjorkman because they fear him. They 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 realize I think he understands what the situation is, and he understands that it's going to take some sort of other revenue source, more broad based revenue source, to deal to 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 deal with the deal with the PFD issue to su- supplant the PFD cuts as, as the revenue source. And I think they fear that he's able to articulate this in a way that, that makes middle and lower income Alaska families understand the problem and understand that this is, that this is part of the solution. And I think they're going out of their way to, 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 you know, to, to use things to try to, to try to pump up Bjorkman and tear down Ben because they fear what he's what he's able to do, and then they and then they throw in the stuff about Clayman and everybody else about how progressive they are. They're progressive because they just want to spend. They're not progressive on the revenue side, and and there's really no one on the on the on the Democrat or Independent side who is progressive on the revenue side. They just all want to spend, and they all want to take it out of middle and lower income Alaska families. So it, it it's it's a um, it's a bizarre. It's a it's a bizarre situation. Any place else, we'd be naming those people limousine liberals, uh, but yet, you know, the progressive blogs don't want to do that because they don't want to undercut the spending. Right, and and you do look at the amount of money that's coming into these races, um, and in many of these races, he does point out, and this was the downside for me, that it's usually a two to one, if not three or four to one fundraising advantage to the democratic candidates which is unfortunate uh down to the last 20 seconds here brad quick thought you look at at who's who's supplying the money it's jim jansen and others in the top 20 percent that want to keep the 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 top 20 percent democrats in place that's the thing you look at where this money is coming from and it's i mean it's shocking matt clayman is outraised um has outraised mia costello 17 to 1 Tom McKay, they they switched in that race. Oh, and, and Tom McKay, you know, sw- swapped out as well. And McKay is still, I'm sorry, yeah, 144,000 for Clayman, 20,000 for McKay. Um, who's the one that had uh, Tom, uh, Denny Wells? Sorry, Denny Wells, $140,000. Mia Costello has raised just $10,000. So it's that's, a, I mean, it's a, there's some going on in there. It's, it's a combination of, it's a combination of unions kicking in a lot of money for those people yeah. Bjork, Bjorkman when you look down at Kenai it's a combination of unions kicking in a lot of money but then you look at the individuals and and Ron Duncan's name shows up more than more more than not Jim Jansen's name shows up more than not it's um and so what you've got is you've got the the top 20 percent fears having people like Ben Carpenter in there who who understands what's going on and says, look, we need to be fair to Alaskans, uh, uh, the you know middle and lower income Alaskans, um, and so they're funding they're funding these top twenty percent Democrats, knowing they'll spend, but that's okay. By Duncan and Jansen, knowing they'll spend because it won't come from their pockets, so you'll take a segment of the a segment of the legislature that otherwise might be looking to raise taxes on non-resident industries, non-oil, and on the top 20%, you're taking that segment and you're neutralizing them by giving them money because they've committed to take it out of the PFD. It's a, it's a, it's an interesting game uh, that, uh, that, that, you know, the, the top 20% are, are, are engaged in 
uh, interesting donations uh, uh, being given on their side. But it's leaving Republicans, it's leaving conservative Republicans sort of behind the eight ball in terms of in terms of less money. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget. So sum it all up for us, Brad, here. Bring it all bring it all back for all three of these today. Um, you know, tie them all together. What are we looking at? I mean, we're looking at a state that uh, has an artificial crisis. You know, how can we get our hands on the big pot of money? Uh, we've got all these progressive uh, ideas that are, well, you know, really regressive more than anything else. Give me the give me your summation here. A couple minutes. Well, I to me, Michael, what's going on is we have people who are who are who are thoughtful enough that they've thought through a way to get to the permanent fund corpus. Um, notwithstanding, you know, the fact that everybody says, oh, no, we'll never touch the corpus. They've thought through a way to get to the permanent fund corpus. And it's sort of sometimes as a lawyer, when you're when you're when you're putting a case together for trial, you start with the end result. I want the jury to do this. How am I going to persuade the jury to do this? How do, what's the steps I'm going to have to go through to get to the point where the jury finds X or the judge finds X at the end of the case? And and here the game is, how are we going to get our hands on the permanent fund corpus so we never have to pay taxes? OK, well. We need to combine the two funds so we can start draining the corpus uh, when the earnings reserve is no longer sufficient to, to fund to fund government. And you back up and you go, well, we need to create a crisis then that 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 says this is how this is why the two funds need to be uh, put together. And then you sort of back up a little bit and okay, so how do we how do we sort of get at the permanent fund dividend? Well, we create a crisis and we need to get at the permanent fund dividend. We continue spending, but we don't want to pay taxes. And so how do we elect legislators that are going to allow us to do that? Well, we support Democrats who otherwise might come at us and 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 support them in their efforts to raid the permanent fund dividend uh, so they can continue spending. Even though it's continued spending, at least it's not on our dime. We're protected from it. It's coming out of the permanent fund dividend first, and then it'll come out of the permanent fund corpus later by overdrawing that. So it, it's a, I mean, from a, from a lawyer standpoint, if you look at this as preparing for trial, it's a great game plan. If you're if you're dry, if the end conclusion you're trying to drive at is get into the permanent fund corpus and drain the permanent fund dividend to avoid taxes on the on the on the way there. Yeah, I uh, and I'm just not I'm just not hopeful that people are going to see it. Ron makes a valid point. Um, you know, basically at the end of his comment here, he says it will take all of the conservatives to get out and vote to make these, you know, to make to stop these things from happening, essentially. Uh, and someone is trying when someone is trying to defeat a union shill, it's almost impossible to out fundraise them only by exposing those with, with an R by their name as the liberals that they are. It's the only way to defeat them. And it will take all conservatives to get out the vote and make it possible. That's part of the problem is that kind of this conservative voting block. A lot of people are just kind of throwing their hands up in the air. And that's that's the challenge here. How do we bring those people back to the table? Well, and and you've got a press. I mean, to to pick up that piece of today's discussion, you've got a press that's not that's not you know focused on the financial aspects of it. So they're just accepting whatever whatever storyline Bert and the others want to spin out there. Bert and Natasha Geisel want to spin out there, and then they're starting into the political analysis of it. Yeah. Um, so how do, how do conservatives even know what the issue is? If you don't have a press, a financial press that's digging into it and understanding what the pieces are. Yeah. Uh, Brad, uh, final thought here, 20 seconds. <laughs> final thought is keep digging, keep understanding, keep talking about it. Keep listening to this show because I think Michael's one of the places where uh, where really the uh, the truth and the and the full understanding of what's it what's at issue is uh, is going on. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, we're just trying to make it understandable, we're taking all these separate pieces and trying to pull them together and make it something that's digestible for the average person who's not into this 24 hours a day. Hopefully we've accomplished something with that. Brad, thank you so much, my friend. As always, it's good to uh, see you. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.